CTV. Canadian Television. Tonight, the campaign against Osama bin Laden gains momentum, and so do the protests. The U.S. hammers Afghanistan for a second night and moves closer to putting troops on the ground. A deadly rampage in Pakistan as militants rage against their own government and the United States. Sending Canadians to war. Ottawa spells out how many will join the fight, but not for how long. And a second anthrax case in Florida. How did the deadly germ get into this building? CTV News with Lloyd Robertson. Good evening. Half a world away in Afghanistan. It is now Tuesday morning and the damage assessments are underway after another long night of American airstrikes. The last raid came just as Afghanis were rousing for early prayers. This second wave of attacks in the U.S.-led war against terrorism sent more bombs and missiles slamming into military sites throughout the country. Reports say the new attacks targeted the capital, Kabul, the Taliban strongholds of Kandahar and Jalalabad, as well as two cities in the north. Our coverage tonight begins with CTV's Alan Fryer in Washington. Alan? Well, Lloyd, the second day of airstrikes is over now. It looks very much as if the U.S. may be running out of targets. Day two, the U.S. using only half the planes it used in the first attack, with bombers and strike aircraft targeting airports, planes, command centers, and ground troops. This following a barrage of 50 cruise missiles that announced the start of the campaign on Sunday. The military mission of yesterday was executed as planned. And at the same time that our good nation dropped over 37,000 kits of food and medicine. Still, the strikes have stopped delivery of food by trucks, for now leaving millions of starving Afghans in even worse shape. The U.S. also denying Taliban reports of civilian casualties. We are taking great pains, and sometimes we put ourselves at even greater risk uh, in order to make every effort to avoid civilian casualties. U.S. officials still not sure how successful the strikes have been and admit there may not be a lot of targets left worth bombing. The cruise missiles and bombers are not going to solve this problem. We know that. Uh, what they can do is to contribute by adding pressure. Part of that pressure, the homes of Osama bin Laden and of the Taliban leader were struck, even though the U.S. knew they were likely not at home. And terrorist training camps carpet bombed an attempt to get bin Laden and his fighters on the run, make moving targets of them. The U.S. stressing that this is just the start and serving notice at the U.N. that other countries could eventually be targeted as well. We will not stop until the terrorist networks are destroyed. To that end, regimes that harbor terrorists and their training camps should know that they will suffer penalties. Our goal is not one individual, it is not one group. But it is for now, and the U.S. getting ready for the next phase, which could mean putting commandos on the ground for the tough and dangerous job of tracking down bin Laden and his fighters. Lloyd? Yes, Alan, tell us a little more about what they're saying there concerning the next phase of the operation. Well, U.S. officials are saying the airstrikes could be over in three days. The hope is that by then the Taliban will have been softened up enough that rebel forces, including the Northern Alliance, could move in and perhaps finish them off. But the airstrikes, that's the easy part. The really hard part now is going to be tracking down bin Laden and his network who are hiding out in the rugged mountains of Afghanistan. That is not a job for cruise missiles. That is a job for U.S. and Allied soldiers. Thank you, Alan. See you Alan Fryer in Washington. And Canada joins the battle. Ottawa has announced its biggest military deployment in combat since the Korean War. A third of our Navy and 2,000 troops are being dispatched in stages to the war zone. It is double the size of the Canadian force deployed in the Persian Gulf War a decade ago. With more on Canada's role, CTV's Roger Smith. This frigate, the Halifax, was already on NATO exercises in the Atlantic. Now it's headed for the Persian Gulf, the first of a Canadian force that the defense minister says is more than just showing the flag. I would stress 
that every role in this campaign is significant. Every country determined to halt terror can make an important difference. The biggest contingent is naval. Three frigates, a destroyer with two aging Sea King helicopters aboard, and a supply ship. Their job, to protect U.S. aircraft carriers. Also, three Hercules transports, an Airbus, and two Aurora patrol planes. They'll help with surveillance, airlift support, and humanitarian aid. And special forces from the Joint Task Force, too. Their mission kept secret for security reasons, but likely to be on the ground inside Afghanistan. We would have had difficulty in doing much more than that. This retired general calls it a reasonable contribution, given the cuts in Canada's military. It's heavy for the Navy, for the Canadian forces as such. It's not an overly heavy commitment. Eggleton said it's too early to estimate the cost of the operation, and he insisted it's just one phase of a long struggle. Winning this campaign in the sense of suppressing terrorism and making people feel safe and secure is going to take much more than a military effort. We can't really predict for you how long the operations are going to last. We do know that we will, we will contribute to them as long as it's required. Amid fears of terrorist retaliation, Eggleton admits that joining the military campaign increases the risk Canada will be a target. Soldiers and police, he says, remain on high alert. Lloyd? Thank you, Roger. So now we know how many Canadians will be sent to Central Asia in support of the coalition. With me is Michael O'Burley-Pitts, U.S. defense expert. Michael, how do you see these forces being deployed in support of the coalition? Within the week, these frigates should be on station um, in the Afghan theater. They will be deployed, if we can go to the Telestrator, in support of the USS Enterprise. It's a large aircraft carrier. Those frigates should provide security around the Enterprise freeing up American assets to continue their combat operations. Also, the CF-18s may be deployed in Uzbekistan. They're ground-based aircraft, and it, that would allow them to rain down on targets of opportunity inside Afghanistan, returning to their bases in Uzbekistan. And how important and effective will this Canadian contribution be to the overall exercise? It's critical. It frees up U.S. assets to continue to engage in combat operations. But let's make no mistake about it, Canadians will be at risk in being on duty in this area. Thank you, Michael. Michael Ovoli Pitts. Ottawa has issued an advisory for Canadians traveling abroad. Foreign Affairs is warning Canadian involvement in the attacks may put travelers at risk. Officials say those overseas should keep in close contact with the nearest Canadian embassy or consulate. As the bombs and missiles pound terrorist targets in Afghanistan today, the political shockwaves were rumbling across neighboring Pakistan. While the government supports the strikes, many people there do not. Today, the American-led attacks triggered a wave of anti-American emotion. Police and demonstrators clashed in city after city, including the capital of Islamabad. Tonight, from Islamabad, CTV's Matt McClure. Matt. Lloyd, Pakistan's military is on high alert. As the missiles rain down across the border in Afghanistan for a second night, the government here is struggling to keep the peace. The smell of tear gas filled the streets in Pakistan Monday as demonstrations here turned violent in the wake of the U.S. and British attacks. The crowd still only numbered in the thousands. But in the Taliban strongholds of Quetta and Peshawar, near the border with Afghanistan, their anger was evident. Smoke filled the skyline as the mobs retaliated by burning buildings. Their first target, a theater that showed Western movies. Journalists in Plato were confined to their hotel while police tried to keep the protesters out. By day's end, one person was dead. Dozens more were injured. Here in the capital, Islamabad, the protests were smaller. The response to the news of an attack on their Muslim neighbors were subdued. I think these attacks are deplorable in every sense, and these should be condemned in to our progress and, and I'm very positive that the vast majority are with us. Pakistan's president, General Parvez Musharraf, downplayed the protests even as he dismissed three senior military officers who were Taliban sympathizers. He told reporters letting the U.S. use the country's airspace to attack the Taliban was a difficult but necessary choice. We sent delegation there. We tried our utmost. But unfortunately, may I say, may I accept that we could not achieve what we were trying with them. 
The Taliban ambassador to Pakistan called the attacks a terrorist act, a violation of sacred Muslim soil. He defiantly declared Osama bin Laden had survived the first wave of strikes. Yes, he is alive, he is inside a person. But the opposition Northern Alliance cheered the intervention as the ragtag but rejuvenated forces pushed closer to Kabul. The future of the Taliban regime is in serious question tonight. Against this backdrop, U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell is set to visit India and Pakistan in the next few days. Roy? That trip is being called a crucial diplomatic push, Matt. What's it going to be about? Well, India and Pakistan are arch rivals. Both of them share a keen interest in the future of Afghanistan, but both of them have very different ideas about what that future should be. Now, Colin Powell's job, and it's a difficult one, is to try and find some middle ground. Lloyd? Thank you, Matt. CDV's Matt McClure in Islamabad, Pakistan. And anti-American sentiments echo across Asia and the Middle East today. There were protests in Indonesia, India, Egypt, and Lebanon, all denouncing the airstrikes. And in Gaza, thousands of angry Palestinians marched in support of Osama bin Laden. They were met by Palestinian police who, failing to stop the demonstration, opened fire. Three people were killed, another 45 were injured. Officials said the rally did not reflect the feelings of the majority of Palestinian people. Dozens of people in Florida are being tested as fears grow of an anthrax outbreak. One man has died and is confirmed a co-worker was also exposed. How did the deadly bacteria get into the building? And later, Canadian troops preparing to fight terrorism and the families they'll leave behind. These stories later on CTV News. It is mysterious and disturbing, and the FBI is taking it very seriously. A co-worker of the man who died of anthrax poisoning in Florida last week has now tested positive for the highly deadly disease. Today, their workplace was quarantined. As CTV's Rosemary Thompson tells us, investigators are looking closely for signs of bioterrorism, whether it was the cause. The anthrax scare led investigators to seal the American media building. The FBI bioterrorism squad began to search after a second man was found to have anthrax spores in his nasal passages. The Attorney General isn't ruling out terrorism. We regard this as an investigation which could become a clear criminal investigation. American media is the biggest tabloid publisher in the U.S., home of The Star, The Sun, and The National Enquirer. The man who was ill worked in the mailroom. Newsweek is reporting he handled a suspicious letter that was sent here before September 11th, containing a powdery substance and a cheap star of David charm. We've also found anthrax within the AMI building, specifically associated with the workstation of Mr. Stevens. Newsweek reports Robert Stevens handled the letter as well. He was a photo editor. He died last Friday. Investigators found anthrax spores on his computer keyboard. This woman worked in the cubicle beside Stevens. They gotta find the source of this and they need to find it very fast. Stupid our minds at least, you know. We're all scared to death. All of the staff were sent to a clinic for tests and a 15-day supply of antibiotics, a treatment that works if given before people begin showing symptoms. The FBI is looking for a link to alleged hijacked ringleader Mohammed Atta, who rented a plane at a nearby flight school and asked instructors about the possibility of buying a crop duster. Investigators say an airborne attack is highly unlikely. For now, they're checking the mailroom and the ventilation system at the American Media Building and they're testing Mohammed Atta's possessions for any trace of anthrax. Rosemary Thompson, CTV News, Washington. And a U.S. manhunt for the suspects in the September 11th attacks has led to hundreds of arrests so far. The U.S. Justice Department says 614 people have been arrested for questioning, and warrants are out for another 229 fugitives. In some other developments on this story, a British journalist who was...